I'm Philip Booth, Editorial and Programme Director at the Institute of Economic Affairs and Professor of Insurance and Risk Management at Cass Business School. If we are to have an appropriate policy response to the crash of 2008, then it's important that we have a good understanding of its causes. Indeed, an understanding of the causes of the crash may well shape attitudes to financial regulation for many years to come. So the first objective of this monograph, Verdict on the Crash, published by the Institute of Economic Affairs, and written by leading academics in the field, is therefore to analyse the causes of the financial crash. And the second objective is then to propose various um, policy responses. It's now widely accepted that the boom and bust culminating in the Great Depression of the 1930s arose as a result of mismanaged monetary policy. Similarly, with the Japanese boom, bust and malaise of the late 20th century. So before we start looking for other causes of the crash of 2008, perhaps we ought to examine whether loose monetary policy was an important issue. And so it turns out to be. For six years from 2001 and 2000 to 2006, the US Federal Reserve sent the message to participants in financial markets that if the markets were to fall, the Fed would underpin them by loosening monetary policy. The Fed kept interest rates too low for too long, and in effect printed too much money. Loose monetary policy led to a huge financial bubble and asset price boom, low saving and a booming consumption. Higher asset prices raised the value of collateral against which loans were secured, making them therefore appear less risky, and also encouraging greater lending and greater leverage, whilst reducing the apparent risk faced by lenders and borrowers. Low interest rates encouraged unsustainable borrowing, consumption and investment and exacerbated the problem of global imbalances. But we should also ask why the boom, financial boom and crash took the particular course it did. Why were all these fancy complex securitization instruments created and traded in such magnitude? And why did they become poisonous and ultimately bring down so much of the banking system? Why did the monetary boom have the particular effects it did? Now banks don't willingly lend to people who have no ability to repay. I remember when I first started studying economics at the age of 13, my economics teacher told me this little rhyme, um, a warning to bankers who should heed it, don't lend money to those who need it. But the Community Reinvestment Act, backed up by progressively tightened state regulation in the US, more or less forced banks to lend to bad risks. By 2005, the US mortgage giants had explicit targets to provide over 50% of their financing to people on below median incomes. In other ways, government policy and capital regulation also had a part to play in the events which led up to the crash. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which drove and developed the market in securitised mortgages, were the creation of politicians and underwritten by government. The providers of capital to these institutions knew that there was an implicit government guarantee. These federal government backed bodies were, the main, were some of the main warehouses for securitised products. International bank capital regulation in the form of the Basel Banking Accord of 1988 and its successor, Basel II, also led to two tragic consequences. They radically distorted the activities of banks, encouraging them to take on gearing in more and more complex ways, and to give the impression that they had offloaded risk through securitisation. Secondly, they adopted the use by banks of very similar types of risk models, and when those risk models turned out to be flawed, it affected the whole system at the same time. To dismiss the myth which still seems to prevail that financial markets were unregulated, you should perhaps take a look at the U U United Kingdom Financial Services Authority Regulation Handbook, or those issued by the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States, which will be no different, I'm sure. The full FSA handbook contains ten sections. The section entitled Prudential Standards is divided into eleven subsections. The subsection Prudential Sourcebook for Banks, Building Societies and Investment Firms is made up of 14 sub subsections. The sub subsection 
market risk is divided into 11 sub sub subsections and the sub sub subsection on interest rates PRR has 66 paragraphs this is what people have called light touch principles based regulation as far as I could see based on this example there could be over 1,100,000 paragraphs in this handbook alone as these are regulators who justify their jobs simply by writing rules yet cannot see the wood from the trees these are the sorts of incentives that bureaucracies have when they're given responsibility for financial regulation. The evolution of regulation in the last 20 years in the UK, and for longer in the US, has ensured that markets have been encouraged to pass responsibility to the regulators. The most important relationships are now between senior bank managers and their regulators, rather than between senior bank managers and the markets. Sadly, shareholders and debt holders didn't monitor in the way that they could have been expected to. They were encouraged to think it was not necessary. Implicit government guarantees, especially of big banks, encourage banks to become too big and take more risks. The fact is that politicians have created the conditions which led to the self-interest of bankers destroying the banking system. So what are the lessons for public policy? Well, from the analysis, the first part of the book, there are perhaps three points to be taken from the analysis. Firstly, a substantial amount of responsibility for the crash lies with government monetary policy institutions, especially in the United States. Secondly, there were many regulatory actions which made the crash worse, and the management of the crash was also poor from the regulatory perspective. Finally, even if one does not accept that regulation was a significant uh, cause of the problems in the banking system, it was certainly not the case that regulators were able to foresee the crash and to stop it from happening, and this clearly should have implications for future policy. Perhaps the most profitable um, line for future policy would be to, not to enhance the power of regulators, who were unable to foresee uh, the crash and its potential consequences, but to restore market discipline. So we need to have a legal framework that ensures that market participants are fully financially responsible for their own actions. The recent crash is a lesson in how both markets and regulators can malfunction. We cannot perfect the regulatory regime. We cannot assume away the problems that public choice and classical economics identify with regulatory systems. Their ability to be captured, their lack of knowledge about individual institutions and future developments in markets, their tendency to over-regulate and their tendency to act slowly. However, we can change the legal framework to ensure that market participants are held to account by markets. In particular, the authors argue that regulators should have a narrow remit and that a legal framework is established that ensures that the providers of capital of a bank are fully accountable for the mistakes they make. There are various ways in which this could be done, and amongst the suggestions by the authors are a mechanism for winding up a systemic bank that is close to insolvency in an orderly fashion, and so that all providers of capital lose everything before depositors lose a penny. Market discipline cannot exist when the government is bailing out bank bondholders and when banks cannot fail. Secondly, a straightforward capital regime for big and small banks. Banks will be administered in the bankruptcy regime if they fell below their capital requirements and profitable parts of the bank will be sold off. Finally, banks should publish more detail of their exposures to the market. The key relationships have been between banks management and regulators when they should be between banks management and shareholders. There are plenty of precedents for the success of this type of regulation working. It sits neatly within the UK tradition of enforcing responsibility through the market within a framework of law that is not intrusive. It certainly would be a reversal of existing systems. Governments and regulators over the last um, generation have made markets less disciplined and this trend needs to be reversed. What is there that is special about banks that makes us want to regulate them so much? Well, certainly for a long time before there was regulation of other financial institutions, there has been regulation of banks. And the, the main reason is because of the, the way in which banks are interrelated to each other through the payment system. 
so that if one bank fails, then if um, that can lead to a knock-on effect leading to the failure of other banks because the payment system collapses. So economists have long argued that um, it might be appropriate to regulate banks in order that the payment system as a whole doesn't collapse as a result of the failure um, of an individual bank. More recently, the argument has been made that because we provide deposit insurance, this reduces the incentives of customers to monitor their banks and reduces the incentive of banks to find ways of signalling to their customers that they are secure and creditworthy banks. And as a result of that, it, um, deposit insurance makes bank failure more likely and that provides an economic rationale for regulating banks to a greater extent. Of course, other people would argue that it's best to um, have less comprehensive deposit insurance so that you have more monitoring by the markets. What do the authors of this monograph think of the current EU proposals to regulate hedge funds and tax havens and other such things? Um, well, the authors would certainly disagree with, with those sorts of EU proposals to regulate institutions, if you like, in the periphery of the financial system. And um, the, 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 reason, the reason is twofold. One is that there is no evidence to suggest that in any sense the crash was caused by the behaviour of hedge funds, private equity, institutions operating out of tax havens, uh, and so on. Secondly, the whole idea of regulating these institutions is largely misconceived because they are not connected um, in the way that banks are um, to the payment system. So if an individual hedge fund fails, then that doesn't have implications on the whole for the rest of the hedge fund industry or the rest of the investment industry. It can just be allowed to fail and the investors lose their money. That's part of the normal market process. Some people, including presumably the European Union, have a concern that the failure, say, of a hedge fund um, might bring down a bank which had lent to that hedge fund. But that um, really isn't a good reason for regulating um, institutions such as hedge funds. That's a reason, if we're going to regulate at all, for regulating um, the behaviour of, of banks and setting their uh, regulatory capital according to the risks that they take on board by uh, their dealings with institutions such as um, hedge funds and other uh, more risky investment vehicles. <laughs>